Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Beth Folsom, and I'm the program manager here at History Cambridge. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that our headquarters, the Hooper Lee Nichols House, sits on the traditional land of the Massachusetts people. So welcome to our program. I would like to start by asking you all to identify yourselves in the chat box so we can get a sense of who's on the call and especially if you have a uh, Brookline and or Cambridge connection that would be great. So go ahead and type in the chat and we can see where everyone is joining us from. Um, a reminder that you can use the chat box to ask questions throughout the program um, and we will have our presentation first and then some Q&A, um, but go ahead and type them in whenever you think of them. I'd like to extend a special thank you and a welcome to the Friends of History Cambridge who've made tonight's event possible. And if you would like to consider joining our group, head over to our website, which is historycambridge.org and click on the support button at the top of the page. And while you're there, you can also sign up to receive our e-news so that you don't miss out on great future events like these. And a reminder that tonight's event is free, but donations are always welcome. And a big thank you to many of you who made a donation for tonight's program. We really appreciate it. After tonight's event, you will be receiving a survey asking how you liked it. Uh, please fill it out. It helps us a lot. We are always looking for feedback. Um, we strive to connect um, and do the best job we can um, meeting folks what, where they are and what they want to know. So we definitely depend on your feedback to make these um, programs even better in the future. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening. Dr. Tatiana Cruz is Professor of Critical Race, Gender, and Cultural Studies and Interdisciplinary Program Director of Africana Studies at Simmons University. A graduate of Williams College and the University of Michigan, Dr. Cruz's work reflects the intersections of African-American, Latinx, women's, urban, and social movement histories, as well as critical race, ethnic, and diaspora studies. She is currently working on a book about African-American and Latinx racial and political identity formation, community development, and mobilizations for racial justice in Boston in the post-war era. Dr. Cruz, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm uh, on the board of History Cambridge, very excited to serve in any capacity, but also a uh, uh, Brookline uh, resident, former resident. I grew up uh, in, Re in Brookline my entire life, went to the Pierce School and Brookline High School and school within a school SWS, as well as all of my siblings. And my mother currently lives in Brookline. Um, so I'm there literally every day. So I'm excited to bridge these Brookline Cambridge worlds together. I see some folks I know, welcome. Um, today, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Barbara Baum. Dr. Brown has had a long career centered on public history and popular education. Um, she's a trained political scientist, though her realm goes far beyond this, as we will see today. Um, she received her PhD from Boston University, and she specializes in Africa. She's an Africanist. Um, she taught at um, University of Botswana and then eventually returned back to BU um, to direct the outreach program at the African Study Center for over 20 years. Um, there she received a number of grants, including a Fulbright and the NEH, to strengthen K-12 teaching in, on Africa. She uh, has published curricula and consulted for PBS, Pearson, and others. And she co-led the successful fight to include African and Latin American history in the Massachusetts State World History Standards. Um, here, though, she's clearly turned to local history, um, which is why we're all here today. Uh, in 2006, she founded Hidden Brookline, bringing to light the hidden history of slavery and freedom. And we're very excited. It's my honor to welcome her and hear more about the Hidden Brookline Project. Welcome. Thank you, Tasiana. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here because what we're doing and what Cambridge is doing and uh, Hingham and Newton and Worcester and all these towns is we're creating history from the ground up so that we're gonna change the way we look, not just at Massachusetts history, but of history of the United States, especially the colonial period. Um, and those of us who are working in the um, local vineyards, um, give thanks to those who are working as scholars in the National Vineyard who have pointed the way for us. 
Now, um, next. We're getting in gear here. Um, uh, and next, please. Nope, just before that one. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Um, and now let's turn to slide three, where we will begin as we do in Brookline, and you probably do in Cambridge on the next slide, with a recognition of the Massachusetts people whose land was stolen. This resolution is read at the opening of every town meeting. I'll give you a chance to take a look at it. As you can see here, and it's true throughout New England, the first people who were enslaved in Massachusetts and throughout New England were indigenous people. Over a thousand people were taken um, to the Caribbean. In Brookline, when the Massachusetts people were forced out, they had to leave a cemetery behind. And that cemetery was, and maybe is, near the Chestnut Hill Reservoir. They used to come back to visit people who were buried there when they couldn't live nearby. Next, please. Hidden Brookline began 16 years ago when the head of our diversity office um, asked me to go take a look at this plaque you see here and tell me what was unusual about it. He wouldn't tell me what was unusual. Next. Now it's your turn to find what was unusual. I'm asking you to look for the names of three enslaved men who marched as Minutemen to fight at the Battle of Lexington. By the way, if you have already done this in Brookline on one of our walking tours, please do not say anything. Um, but for the rest of you, once you found the names or think you found the names, please put your answer in the chat. And now I'll give you some time to look. And Beth will tell us when we have the three names appear. I believe we have somebody. Yep. Yep. We have that a is number a of good guesses. You folks are the fastest group I've ever seen. The, fifth, the third graders and the adults in Brookline usually spend about the same amount of time coming up first with some very odd names that they think must mean the name of an enslaved person. Now, on to the next slide, please. As you can see, there are three ways to tell that these people are enslaved. One of them is that their names are at the bottom. The second obvious one is that they're all possessives. They're all possessions. And the third one is that none of them has a surname, meaning none of them are full considered full adults in Brookline. Uh, next. Oh, sorry, there's one more thing I need to say about that slide, but we don't have to go back. Yes, uh, Malcolm Cawthorn, one of the outstanding high school social studies teachers in Brookline, has taken his students for many years to this plaque to look for those names. And a number of years ago, he asked the group um, what they made of those names. And after a pause, one student answered quite bitterly. He said, I've been lied to for 12 years. And that's what all of us want to prevent. And we also want all of us to know more of that history. On to the next slide. Thanks, Beth. We do know what happened to Prince. Prince gained his freedom, though he fought at the Battle of 
Lexington, he did not get his freedom there. He gained it by running away, by finding his own way in the world. And um, so he is one of the hidden heroes of Brookline, one of the African-Americans that we do not recognize as one of the trailblazers of our town. And it also reminds us this particular, uh, this is a, an ad from a newspaper, is that it's never just about slavery. It's always slavery and freedom. And that's why we are the Hidden Brookline Committee of Slavery and Freedom. Um, and you'll see some more of that in a little bit later. Now, I wonder, and this is just a question for you to think about and answer. How old were you when you learned that Massachusetts whites had enslaved both indigenous people and African peoples? Mine is when the head of diversity office asked me to go look at that placard. Across Cambridge and beyond, we're uncovering hidden history, exposing the truth, sharing it. Um, and that is one of the exciting things about this period in American history. Now on to the next slide. Now, here's a person who visited Brookline before the Civil War. I'd like you to put a few words in the chat that you think um, says something about who this person is, what kind of a person they are. Um, and now I'll give you a few minutes to do that. And for those who already know, don't put anything in the chat. <laughs> I forgot to say that. Go ahead. What do you see when you see this person's image? We had a spoiler, but that's okay. <laughs> we had a spoiler. Well, when I do this on a walking tour, because she stayed at all three underground railroad houses in Brookline, going to a different one each day, because she and her husband had escaped from Georgia, a thousand miles, to be free. She had dressed, disguised herself as a white male plantation owner, traveling with his enslaved man, William. And there were many close calls along the way. They told their story, they wrote their story, which has been published ever since, about what happened along the way. They got to Boston and they started speaking out from first person stories about what their lives had been like under slavery. And the slave catchers came for them. The 1850 law had passed the Fugitive Slave Act. And she was hidden in Brookline while he was hidden in different parts of Boston as people got ready to get them to Canada, to England. And then from England after the Civil War back to Georgia, they chose to go back to Georgia where they set up a school for, um, for children and adults and a cooperative farm for free African-Americans. So this is another example of a person who should have a major motion picture written up, done about her. I mean, what are we missing here? Romance, love, danger, freedom, and yet nothing has been done. There are only a few books and most of them are children's books and I'm glad they're children's book. So on to the next slide. And the next one, that's the cover of a children's book, Florida Ruffin Ridley. And she does call her first name Florida, pronounce it. Florida Ruffin Ridley is the new name for a school that's 130 years old. Ridley, interestingly enough, was best friends of Marie, Mariah Baldwin of Cambridge, two women who took the names away from two racists who'd had those na names of the school before. In Cambridge, it was Lewis Agassiz and in Brookline, it was an enslaver, Edward Devotion. There was a lot of controversy over removing, um, over removing Devotion's name and putting Ridley's name on it. 
And the problem with Ridley, Ridley, again, this is hidden history, is that nobody knew who she was. Now take a look in the next slide at who she was and what she accomplished. Another slide before that. This is Ridley in her 30s when she was most active. And these are only three of the many things she did. She also founded the first um, Negro Folklore Society in the United States. Uh, she was an extraordinary woman, lived in Brooklyn for over 20 years where she raised her children um, and had a hard time apparently finding a house. She and her husband were the first African-American homeowners in Brookline. Why was it so hard? It was because people said, well, devotion's a good enough name. Who is this Ridley? And until you know your history, especially your local history, you don't have the freedom and you don't create the freedom for others to acknowledge these people. And it is extraordinarily wonderful. If in the questions you'd like to hear more about the fight, the two-year fight to get the name changed, I'd be glad to tell you about it. And it involved a lot of students at that school fighting for the name change. Um, now, let's go on to the next slide. Here is another man whose name should be known everywhere. Roland Hayes, he broke the color bar in classical music, being the first man to sing with a major orchestra in the United States, no, to perform with a major orchestra in the United States, first man who was African-American or woman. And here is his daughter, Africa, Africa, and granddaughter and great-grandson. And the audience at the unveiling in front of his house um, of the stone to honor him. Why have we not known about him? Why have we not known about a trailblazer for justice who lived here for 50 years? I could tell you one story after another about what he did, but we'll stop for there and keep on going um, because I really want you to just pay attention to how much history has been lost. It's not just the history of slavery, it's the history of freedom and it's the history of African-American leadership and freedom. Now we're on to the second section, slavery and freedom in Brookline. And um, what we have focused on in our, in our committee has been entirely public education. And we've done it because doing public education on slavery and on freedom in a local way takes an abstract concept of slavery and of freedom and puts it into real terms. People who walk down these streets, people who lived in these houses, it's a place where people know it's real. And so that's why we focused on Brookline. Also, it's part of the process of everybody learning about the history of Massachusetts. On to the next slide, please. What you'll see here, everything in blue is the property of slave owners in 1746. That's about half of the town of Brookline. Quite, quite extraordinary. And if you're wondering where is what, the um, main road that goes um, up and down, those are Washington Street and Harvard Street roughly. And then the Charles River has moved from where it is because of different um, efforts to make the Charles River more functional. Every the big chunk in blue is the Coolidge Corner area in Brookline Village. Edward Devotion's house was in Coolidge Corner, and that's where the school is as well. Um, slavery was so common and so important to Massachusetts that in 1641, 11 years after Matt Brookline, I mean, Boston was founded, Massachusetts became the first of the 13 colonies to put slavery into law. Next, please. This is a partial list that we have on our website of the enslavers and the enslaved. There were roughly, at this point, not that we know of, 90 enslaved people 
and 42 enslavers. What this means is that many of the enslaved people were living alone in, in an enslaver's house, often in the kitchen, in a corner of the kitchen, um, where they would be there at the beck and call. Um, the names of the enslaved were chosen in a very unusual way by the enslavers. Um, and if you'd like to hear more about that, it's really interesting, uh, at least to me, and I'll tell you more about that in question and answer. On to the next. In 1773, enslaved African Americans in Massachusetts petitioned the state legislature to end slavery. They did it again several more times before slavery had in fact ended they were taking care of their own lives. They said, we have no property. Now, the next part's really important. We have no wives, we have no children, and we have no country. In Brookline, they were right, and in Massachusetts, the lives of the enslaved in Massachusetts were systematically warped in a way that was quite different from the South. That doesn't mean it was better or worse, it was different. And it caused enormous loneliness. The enslavers only wanted mostly men to work on their farms. So they bought twice as many men as women. And then the few enslaved women that there were, few of them had children because the enslavers said it made it quite clear that they did not want to have any enslaved children around. As one Brookline slave trader said, Thomas Perkins, it's hard to sell an infant. Half of the enslaved children who were born in Brookline died before they were old enough to work. Um, which was the age of around 11. So the, it was the social life that was so particularly awful. There are all kinds of ways for social life to be awful, but the systematic warping in New England was of this nature. It is likely that some of the enslaved adults created chosen kin to make up for the families that they did not have. Now, where did these enslaved people come from? On to the next slide. Ah, before we get to that, sorry. What are these plantation homes doing in Brookline? The one on the left is Thomas Perkins, the one on the right is Samuel Perkins. They had fond memories of their lives in the Caribbean, so they built houses to resemble Caribbean homes. Not very practical for Brookline, but there we are. Um, now slide 18, the next one. This is the Boston Harbor. The Boston Harbor was critically involved, majorly involved in Caribbean trade. By 1680, Half of the ships in the Boston Harbor were either going to or coming from the Caribbean. Why were they doing that? On to the next slide. Because the Caribbean was the center of New England trade. Selling to the Caribbean were food crops, cod, cow, cattle. And you may be wondering, why are these things going to the Caribbean? Can't they grow them themselves? They could, they chose not to because sugar was so incredibly valuable through the world that they didn't want to spend any land on food crops. So they imported them from New England. And even today in Jamaica, salt cod is a favorite dish because they had to be salted in order to get to the Caribbean. Boston was famous for its rum and had many rum distilleries. Uh, and here's what they bought from the Caribbean. They bought slaves 
and they preferred to buy from the Caribbean than from Africa because the people in the, who had arrived in the Caribbean had already learned some English or perhaps French um, and were used to, if I can put it that way, being enslaved. They had some understanding of the limits of their power. And so the uh, most of the slaves in the United States came from the Caribbean. The Caribbean was full of African slaves because the life of an enslaved person in the Caribbean was roughly seven years because it was so much cheaper to import. And from the sugar came molasses, which went north for rum. Now, in a basic sense, when you look at this map, think of Cambridge and Boston and Brookline as having plantations, but they were in the Caribbean. Or to put it another way, as a scholar has said, this was a slave society here in Massachusetts and most of the slaves lived elsewhere. Now, on to the men who made this possible. There were six slave traders who lived in Brookline. Thomas Burke Perkins was one of the wealthiest and most successful of them. Not only did he trade in, in people, he also trade in illegal opium, forcing it into China when China had forbidden it. Um, and as you can see, the Perkins School was named in appreciation for Thomas Perkins' generosity when he retired. He became a man who gave money away, gave money from his ill-gotten goods um, for his generosity. Now the next slide. Here's a building at the Perkins School and you'll see in front of it a delegation um, from around the world to see how the Perkins School um, works because it is indeed a very successful school. If you go to the Perkins website, you will unfortunately find a page about the founders and about Thomas Perkins. They say he was a merchant prince of enormous generosity and humanity who gave to the school to keep it from going bankrupt. The next slide, please. This is a family that started with a slave trader, George, Senator George Cabot, who used to live on the North Shore, but moved to Brookline and became a Massachusetts Senator to Washington in 1791 and was there until 1796. In 1793, he passed the first um, Fugitive Slave Act. Now look at the other two men. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, also of Massachusetts, and then Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr. A perfect example of the power and influence and wealth that can be passed down through generations from the slave trade. Next, please. Now this is a time to reflect on the work that has been done and that you have been doing and other people have been doing. And I would say that public education is the first step toward restorative justice. If we don't know what's happened, if we don't know what people have done or people are continuing to do, there is no way that restorative justice will happen. So public education is fundamental. Now, what we do locally is we make it real. On to the next slide. Our first effort in Brookline, we, we tried to figure out what would be powerful and public. And we decided to put a, a, a memorial stone inside the cemetery uh, in Brookline. It took us two years. And it took us two years in part because the first time we went to the cemetery trustees, the citizen committee, they said we lied. That there were not slaves buried in there, that was not possible. Well, 
Uh, fortunately, the head of diversity kept me from leaping across the table. And um, we came back at their next monthly meeting and gave them the evidence and written evidence. And they said, you're trying to shame us. I have to say these were mostly very old people and um, this was particularly hard for them to grasp since they had such a limited understanding of American history. Then they said, we won't let you put the stone inside of the cemetery. We were furious. We knew we could force them to put it inside the cemetery, but it would take us a year. And then we realized that they'd just done us a favor because the only people who go inside the cemetery are dog walkers and teenagers with beer bottles. So clearly to put it on the outside wall of the cemetery on a main street was a much better idea. We also had a fight over the wording. We lost, but it, we didn't lose much. Um, and this is just an, one of the examples of how change is hard. And the advantage of having a committee that does nothing but work on this. Um, whenever I take a group to the um, on a walking tour and we come to this stone, we always stop and I ask them two questions. The first question is, why did it take 209 years for us to recognize slavery in Brookline? And then I leave it to a good discussion. The second question worth asking at this point is now that we know, what can we as a community, not just as individuals do to heal the continuing wounds of white supremacy? Next, please. We have tried varied program, programming in order to bring in varied audiences. This was a classical concert with a little bit of gospel thrown in and a couple of speeches. Um, and Robert Honeysucker said at the concert, who he died last year, I believe, that if it had not been for Roland Hayes, Robert Honeysucker would never have had a career. Marian Anderson said the same thing about Roland Hayes. Now the next slide, please. We've done something very different. With the veterans services, we honored the three enslaved men for the first time, 241 years late. Now, we have a plan, and this is for you. We have a plan to place a sizable memorial stone about these three men but we don't have enough people in the committee right now to work to make this happen. So if you're at all interested in having a celebration and having a memorial stone, celebration of their lives, join us for this project. And I guarantee you, it'll be satisfying. Next, please. We do walking tours for students and adults. And now I wanna talk about schools. Schools are probably the most powerful place for learning an accurate history of slavery, especially with younger students when they don't have to do a lot of unlearning, which the older students have to do. Our combined districts, Cambridge and um, Brookline, is close to 14,000 students. Think of 14,000 students getting an education on the real history, on the complicated history of slavery and freedom and the revolution. Now, here in Massachusetts, our third grade curriculum, finally, for the first time three years ago, said, mentioned enslaved Africans. Third grade requires a teaching of colonial history and Massachusetts geography, colonial Massachusetts history. They barely mentioned the enslaved, but they finally mentioned them. This provides us an opportunity because now we have a placeholder to create curricula to work with students at the grade three level across the state, across the towns, across Eastern Massachusetts. 
Before then, the state standards lied. I'm sorry, I still can't get over lies. Now, you might think that getting slavery into the curriculum, not just into the standards, would be easy, right? I wish it were so. Many teachers are uneasy because they are under attack with CRT. Few know about slavery and freedom here, especially since third grade teachers are mostly English language arts and math teachers. And they've gotten little guidance in professional development on how to teach a difficult su subject and how to teach across race. But there's a solution. It's way past time for this solution. We can get money, foundation grants, maybe state government grants to do third and fifth grade curriculum on slavery and freedom in Massachusetts, have a series of summer institutes. Um, I think it's quite an exciting topic for this time in the United States or in this state in the United States and it's grant worthy. Anybody who would like to work on it, uh, again, let me know or let um, History Cambridge know. Now, I'd like to move on to the, oh, this next slide. This will give you an idea of the breadth of what we do on our Hidden Brookline site. If you just Google Hidden Brookline, um, you'll find the site. Um, and we're preserving the history so that 30 years from now, people are trying to figure it all out again. Now, my final slide is to invite you to a walking tour. In a month and a half, I'll be doing a walking tour of three sites. If you find it difficult to walk, you can drive from site to site uh, in a car and there is parking at each one of the sites. All you have to do is Google BACEP, which stands for Brookline Adult Community Education Program, um, to sign up. And then um, what I'd like to end with, and this is not on the slides, I'd like to just talk to you straight. The biggest challenge facing us right now is complacency. I know about slavery. Oh, it was awful. We need to bring in disruptive knowledge so that they don't feel all comfortable with their knowledge of slavery. And now here's a shout out to Abby Erdman and Meadow Dibble for the idea here. And that is to use disruptors. Use things that jolt people. One of the things we use is to simply say a fact, some fact. Massachusetts was a slave colony for 166 years. Massachusetts was the first colony to put uh, slavery into law. And if you go from Virginia and you start at 1619 and go to 1865, we haven't yet had more years of freedom than of slavery. We'll have to wait till 2111 for that. Then another disruptor is simply to upend the existing story. Oh, this is fun. Take the cradle of liberty. That's what we're known as. Take the freedom trail, take the tea party. All three of these things took place at the same time as slavery. Yes, we fought for our independence. And yes, we still had slavery. I'll give you one simple story and say, when Paul Revere rode to Lexington, he rode past the hanging flesh and bones of an enslaved man who had been executed 18 years earlier and hung in a cage to rot in public in order to make sure that black people would be obedient. We need to tell a broader, more complicated story. We need to talk about the men who fought for freedom, the people who put that petition forward in 1773, the people who escaped, the people who did sly things in their households. We need, more importantly and basically, simply an accurate history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Uh, I'd like to clap it up <laughs> virtually <laughs> for you. Um, that was so great. Um, 
I, I learned so much. Uh, you know, I'm I'm embarrassed because I'm a historian of African American history and I know so little about um, the the people you spoke about in my hometown in Brookline. Um, so how the next part will be is I'm just going to ask a couple of prepared questions I have for Dr. Brown and then um, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll get to those in a little bit. But hopefully we have plenty of time for a, a discussion here. Um, so I'd like to begin um, by talking about um, how your project has been received by uh, Brookline residents. Um, you spoke a little bit about some of the challenges you faced um, in erecting some of these memorials. Um, and I just would love to hear more about, you know, what do you think the legacies of uh, slavery and white supremacy are in Brookline and specifically uh, the racial politics of Brookline and like, what have been some of the successes and challenges you've had in recruiting participants um, to engage with both uh, as, you know, members of your coalition, as well as, you know, engage with your public events? Ah, uh, yes, the nitty gritty of organizing for change. That's a great question because that's, <laughs> yeah. Um, the legacy of slavery and the racism in Brooklyn is a big story. I don't know how much I'll be able to touch on it, but I'll touch on it. When we started uh, Hidden Brookline, we immediately became a multiracial committee because of the people who wanted to be on it. Um, and we stayed that way for a very long time. And what happened is that over time, I mean, imagine this is 16 years. People don't necessarily stay on a committee for 16 years. Um, I'm the fool, uh, and they come and they go, or they're attracted to a particular project, like the Roland Hayes project, um, and they work on that, and then they go to, on to something else. So we've had people come and go, um, and right now we have uh, a Latinx um, web editor, who's amazing, graduate of Brookline High also, and um, uh, a white researcher who's um, helping me. And I work with the diversity office, which is a very, um, I don't know what you would call it, multiracial is an odd word, but um, is a diverse um, commission of uh, town employees. We are thinking about starting a conversation with the Perkins School Board. Um, and that, and for things like that is when you pull in different people who've got the expertise for that. I don't have the expertise for having a conversation with the board of the Perkins School, but there are others in Brookline who want to have that conversation. So we pull in people for special um, projects. The, other th the thing that has helped a great deal was the flap, the controversy over Edward Devotion. It all started when an African-American woman in Brookline um, was wondering about the history of Brookline in terms of race and came across our website and went, damn, Edward Devotion was an enslaver and we've got a school still named after him? How would black students feel going into such a school? The thing was, is nobody knew at that time, almost no one knew. I know of a leading African-American scholar, um, oh, what is her name? She, was, she founded Brookline's African-American Studies Program, um, Adelaide Cromwell. She was on the Brookline Historical uh, Society Board and she'd never heard there was slavery in Brookline. Um, so it's been a very well hidden um, story, not just in Brookline, but elsewhere. And I can tell you some of the reasons why it's been hidden. But once that came out, everybody had to reckon with slavery in Brookline. Some people said, well, it was only one enslaved person. Other people went, are you kidding? Um, and so it launched a townwide discussion, especially for the parents and the students and the teachers at that school. And that's the biggest school in the town and it's in the center of town. So that's made an enormous difference. And all along we've been doing walking tours, um, particularly ironically at the Edward Devotion School, now the Ridley School, um, but they've never done the grade three curriculum. 
So it's been an uneven, unsuccessful, successful journey. And part of that is because we are such a heavily white town with a large population of first and second generation Asian Americans who don't consider themselves touched by this so much. Um, that racism goes on in Brooklyn at an enormously high level. I'm sure everybody here has heard about the $11 million the town has had to pay um, to a firefighter who was fired um, for complaining about racism. And a large movement tried to prevent that, tried to get the town to engage with him years ago and the town government refused. Um, and we have differences in success in schools. We have differences in the way people are treated around town. Um, so this isn't gonna solve, <laughs> this is not, this is just one small piece or one small step, baby step. Thank you. Actually, that, that's a perfect segue into my next question. Um, and I thank you for that. I know I'm asking, I'm gonna ask some difficult questions. Um, my next question is actually specifically about race, identity and, and local politics. Um, as a white scholar who's committed to uncovering this less known um, African-American history, um, what do you think the role should be of white residents in Brookline, um, both for leading initiatives like this, like Hidden Brookline, but even kind of broader uh, efforts for racial justice or reparative justice, use of restorative justice. I might use the word reparative to remind folks about slavery and reparations. Um, but yeah, what do you think the role is, um, considering the majority of the town is white, um, what is the white role <laughs> frankly, in, you know, these sorts of initiatives? Actually, I don't think anymore it's the white role. It's the white and it's the non-black role, given our population. Um, and the role of whites, I remember at an early meeting before we did the... <laughs> the stone in the cemetery, someone said that we had, we had been offered a, a fife and drum um, music for that time because of the, these were, there was a revolutionary war soldier there. And I remember um, uh, a man named Mark Grace saying, I'm not gonna have any fife and drum band at a solemn memorial for Afri enslaved African Americans. And I'm not having any hot dogs either because the um, people who provide the concessions for the Red Sox offered to provide concessions for us for free. We did get some um, ice cream sandwiches from them. But the more important thing we did there was we provided white carnations for people to put in front of the graves where we knew people were buried. It's hard and it's I'm not sure I'm careful enough to always listen and to listen hard. And to, you know, there's a danger in having a PhD because you get in front of a class and you're supposed to know it all. And I don't want to be a know it all, but that's a temptation I, I face. And, um, Fortunately, the head of the diversity office is a very kind gentleman. And one time he said, well, Barbara, I think you'll be on the, should be on the sidelines on that issue. Um, which was a very kind way of saying, you're wrong. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um, and I guess my last question before we open it up to the audience um, is really about kind of lessons learned. I'm, you know, I'm a historian and I'm really interested in the process you did in conducting this research, as well as um, creating this kind of public history initiative. Um, from what I understand, it seems to be a little focused on memorials and there's a lot of discussion in the public about the role of memorials. Um, what, what role do they play? Um, 
And I'm just kind of curious as to kind of your direction, kind of lessons learned in this long organizing and this project, um, and what can folks outside of Brookline, like in Cambridge, um, kind of take away to kind of turn inwards into their own communities to think about issues of slavery and freedom and how to bring this to the public and you know to the schools at large. Mm -hmm. Right from the beginning, we wanted to do work with the schools in terms of curriculum. And Colonial Massachusetts grade three was natural since it was already in five and eight. And the social studies coordinator was eager. Uh, a curriculum was created by teachers um, under the direction of the social studies coordinator. It was piloted. Teachers were given a group of teachers from each one of the eight elementary schools were given professional development. And there were about three walks a year out of about 27 classes, third grade classes, 33rd grade classes. And then it just kind of disappeared. Um, and there's a new initiative by an African-American Brookline third grade teacher who's just retired to make this happen again. And, um, and she's one determined woman and um, she's asked me to be an advisor and so I'll be an advisor and I'm glad she's doing it. Memorials haven't been the biggest thing. I've mentioned three memorials because that's, it's one way for passersby to see. But I think the big achievement was the changing of the school's name because it got forced everybody to talk and to take a side. And that was not our initiative. We helped on that. Um, and we were glad to help. And that's some of the great things that happens in town. We now have a sculpture to, done by John Wilson, who lived here in Brookline for 50 years whose sculpture Martin Luther King is in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. That was an initiative from another group of people that we supported. So there's a lot going on and we don't expect to be in charge. And yeah, and I have learned so much along the way. Some of the things I've just said are things I did not understand three years ago. Thank you so much, um, both uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Cruz. Uh, this was a wonderful um, uh, back and forth between the two of you and wonderful presentation, Dr. Brown. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start um, giving a few of the questions that have popped up in the chat. And please feel free, uh, folks, to add um, yours. So I'm going to go back to, let's see. Sean is asking, Dr. Brown, what is the goal regarding the Perkins School? Acknowledgement, acknowledgement, name change, anything else? Is there, what is the, is the goal to um, take some action on the, on the Perkins School? I think the goal is for them to um, think deeply. That's our goal. Um, and then to perhaps, um, encourage them to think more deeply about things that they hadn't thought of. Um, there are all kinds of things that they could do. Um, and it would be disrespectful, I think, to just come with a list of things they should do um, because you're not gonna get much change that way. That doesn't mean you can't be forceful. Um, and we realized that it would not be a good idea to start with a big page one article in the Boston Globe about this. Um, because hackles would be raised and it wouldn't be a way for them to start with a conversation. The advantage of a conversation is the timing. George Floyd's death has changed everything in the United States, including the increase in white supremacy and including the heightened understanding that we've got to do something. So there's a group of us, and I'm not going to say who's in the group, and I'm just a lesser member, 
we're talking about this. Thank you. Um, on a follow up, Jessica wants to know how many years of research did it take to uncover the extent of slavery in Brookline? And um, can you talk about some sources that were fruitful in helping to uncover? And have you have you completely uncovered or um, brought to a wider audience um, the history of enslavement in Brookline? Or is there more work to do to um, not just bring it to the public, but to actually do more research and, and broaden um, the extent to which we know about um, the enslaved and enslavers? No, it's been, um, I started with the secondary sources and I was surprised to find that a book published in the 1890s and another one in the 1930s, Histories of Brookline, that they were very matter of fact about slavery here. In the time between 1800 and 1865, the, um, the abolitionists did everything they could to brand Massachusetts as the cradle of liberty, knowing that it had just come from slavery. Because by branding it as this positive, wonderful thing, then people could get behind the positive patriotism. And that was part of the reason why that history got hidden. It was a deliberate decision on the part of some and the part of others, of course, it was let's hide this away, this is shameful. And then other people who just don't pay attention. The history I found besides those two books, I then went to church records because there was only one church then. And they recorded all the births, deaths, marriages and baptisms. Not for some of the, many of the years have been lost but you can find a whole lot in there. So you find um, the names of enslaved people, the infants. Um, you find the lack of marriages. There were one marriage uh, of enslaved people in Brookline who lived apart and had children. And one of their children became, lived long enough to become free at the age of 25, uh, married and moved to Dorchester. I'd love to find out more about him. Um, but I haven't gone there. And um, looking at census records, we've just found out some interesting things about the Heath family of Heath School. So some of it's poking around and some of it's just plain good luck. The town had, the Historical Society had a map of 1746 with all the uh, property owners on the map and I just started coloring it in with those I knew who were enslavers. And out came a map of slavery in Brookline. Um, so it's not that I ever sat down full time or even half time and said, I'm gonna do this research. It's been 16 years, so pieces and pieces have come together. And there are pieces that we don't know yet. And anybody who wants to do that, they're welcome. We need somebody particularly on, um, the Cabot family and uh, the Heath family. So I have a, a follow-up question on that. And I'm just wondering, um, I know that for local historical organizations, especially what is so important um, is that, you know, these, these stories, these histories are known and told in the families and communities in which they happened um, more than they are shared with the wider community, right? So how a lot of what you need to, um, to do is to form connections and to build trust um, with family members, descendants, and people that are um, in those communities. And I'm just wondering if that's something that, you know, um, through the, the eyes of, um, of those who are descendants of enslaved and free um, Black Brookline residents and Cambridge residents. This is uh, applicable for, for our, um, our experiences as well. But how, how has it been to try to build those relationships to um, kind of make folks feel that you as an organization can be trusted to keep and share their stories? I wish we had more stories to keep and to share. There are very few stories. 
the records of slavery in New England are very different from the records of slavery in the South, I'm told. I don't know enough. This is not my direct field, um, as Tatiana said at the beginning. Um, and, and I haven't heard of too many people who've done that here in New England. Um, what I'm trying to do is to get it out of archives and get it out of exhibits. We've also had quite a few library exhibits um, and get it more public. And now I would say that all of the people involved in town government, all the citizens involved in town government, I think they all know that there was slavery in Brooklyn and that's a massive change but it's still superficial because they're just added it on. Oh yeah, there was slavery everywhere. Um, they don't see what happened when slavery ended and the segregation and um, grew and the discrimination grew, um, not just in the South, but in Massachusetts. And that it's continued to this day. That's where we need more research, is what's happened in the last 100 years. So I have a, another question from the chat that talks about the, um, a similar situation um, with the Ruffin School um, and the Baldwin School. It, it specifically deals with the Vassal Street School in Cambridge. Um, and it's, uh, Caitlin's asking if there's an organized movement um, to change the name of the Vassal Street School. Um, I know that there, that there are, um, some, I'm not sure how um, ready they are to act right now. I know there are some, um, but I would love to hear if anyone um, on the call knows more about the efforts um, surrounding the Vassal Street School. Um, I know it's also um, a different, it's tricky in a different way. Um, I know some folks have talked about the um, fact that if it remains Vassal Street and Vassal Street School, um, there are both um, white, enslaver vassals and there are black um, folks who have who were granted and or um, took their freedom um, who are also named vassal uh, who chose to keep the vassal name even um, after their um, they uh, left enslavement or were freed from enslavement um, so I know that's a that's something that people see as both problematic and potentially a, a bridge to some sort of um, keeping of the vassal name because it represents both black and white Cambridge residents, but mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear if anyone has anything to put in the chat um, or jump on uh, about the Vassal Street School, um, let us know. So. Where, where is the Vassal Street School? I mean, I know, I, I just don't know of it. That's a great question and I actually don't know. Oh, Tobin, okay. Marika says it's Tobin. Oh, okay. That, that's the Tobin Street School now? Okay. Just, thank you. Yes. Glad you asked. Absolutely. Uh, we had another question, which was, who, is there a group um, that is sort of spearheading this or doing similar work to what Hidden Brookline is doing in Cambridge? Um, and I would say, yes, I would say there are um, a number of groups and History Cambridge is definitely, um, we see our role as being a convener, being a hub, um, being a place where folks can go to get information because there are so many great um, organizations doing things. Um, the um, Black Action and um, Black Action for History in Cambridgeport, Cambridge Black History Alliance. Um, we have folks at um, Harvard. We have folks at different um, religious institutions and, and um, educational institutions, uh, the Historical Commission. So I'm going to drop a couple of um, links in the chat to our Black History resource hubs that we have on um, cambridgehistory.org, uh, historycambridge.org, sorry. Um, I'll put those in the chat if folks want to see those um, because there is so much great work going on and sometimes it's a matter of um, 
consolidating and being aware of what everyone's doing. Um, and because uh, there, there are a lot of folks working on this. Okay. Let's see. I have a question. Um, I don't know if there's a question you were ready to ask, Beth. No, go ahead. Go right ahead. Um, no, um, Dr. Brown, I thought um, your your point about third grade is really important to me, third and fifth grade. Um, I have children, and um, actually one of my children is in the third grade at an independent school in Cambridge, actually. Um, but um, she's learning about slavery, and it seems totally normal. <laughs> seems totally normal for a third grader to learn about slavery. Um, and I, there's a lot of educators on the call, um, both from uh, Brookline and from Cambridge and from various parts. Um, so this is a question to you, but I hope that other educators might chime in too. Um, what do you think is the resistance to teach slavery uh, in Brookline schools in third grade? Um, or early on in elementary school. Um, previous to my position here, I, I taught at Leslie in Cambridge. Uh, all, my, all my students were pre-service teachers um, and they were really nervous about talking about slavery. And they took my courses and were like, please teach me how I can be an effective teacher in third, fourth, fifth grade, right? How to, how to be a teacher and how to teach about slavery. Um, and so I'd love to hear more about kind of working with teachers. What kinds of trainings do they need? Um, does this reflect kind of just, you know, where social studies and history is going that, you know, they're not getting enough training coming in? Um, what is the role of principals and, you know, teacher, uh, educators? I'd love, just love for you to unpack that a little bit more. And, and I welcome others to contribute too, if you have thoughts on, you know, um, bringing this to the curriculum of public schools. I'll say a couple of very brief things because I'd love to hear from teachers um, in, in any school district. Um, I worked for 27 years doing public education on Africa for the schools and they needed, people needed two things. They needed good curriculum resources and they needed good professional development. And if they had one without the other, it was like um, having to walk with a crutch. You can walk well and you can do all kinds of things, but it's not as easy. Um, and so that can discourage some people. And both in terms of Africa, but especially in terms of slavery and freedom, people need to learn how to become comfortable with this. Um, the teacher who did the, and um, so that's why professional development is especially important. There are other ways to come at that. I mean, Boston for a while had teachers um, writing together, observing their own classes on how they dealt with race and then coming together in groups of um, five to talk about it with a grant, that would be another way to open the gates. I mean, there, there are a whole lot of different ways to, to begin to do this. We have another question. Um, Sarah is wondering whether you have explored regional connections among enslaved or between enslaved and free people. Um, and also if you explored the lives of black people in Brookline or elsewhere after slavery was ended in Massachusetts. I know that one is definitely something that you're passionate about um, sharing the, the um, stories of black people who either um, claimed their own freedom or um, were legally set free um, and what happened to them and their communities and families afterwards. But um, the question about um, the connections uh, uh, on a broader regional level. Is very I don't have enough of a background on 19th and 20th century uh, Massachusetts in terms of race, um, particularly Eastern Massachusetts or just the Boston area. I don't know how much has been written on it and Tatiana, maybe you can help me because what I've done for the period since slavery ended is highlighted extraordinary trailblazers. Um, which is important because people think that, people tend to have this notion that um, white people made the big difference in changing, um, ending racism. Um, so African-American trailblazers are real important and they're easy to find in some sense, but to find the nature of the town and the, um, 19th and 20th century is harder. One person I 
Farida Ruffin really spoke about that in 1927 when um, she was mm, almost 70. And she spoke about how she had made a mistake. She'd made a fundamental strategic mistake. She had thought that blacks and white would work together to end the racism that already existed in Massachusetts. And um, as they had worked together to end slavery and she kept working to bring white people into the struggle against lynching. There was not apparently a single white organization involved in the anti-lynching movement in this state. That is unbelievable. The Unitarian Church, she wrote a famous letter in the Boston Globe about how, why the Unitarian Church refused to condemn lynching nationally in the 1890s. Um, and so she spent, she said she spent too much time looking for white allies in order to make change. But she was smart enough to start several black organizations. Um, and smart isn't the right word. She was strategic enough. Um, so I'd need to know the scholars context before I could go looking for what was happening locally. And now I'm still up to my ears in telling the story of what happened up until about 1810. So my next question for you goes um, somewhat along those regional lines. I'm just um, thinking of what we're calling our efforts to really um, collaborate with other local uh, cities and towns in the Cambridge, Brookline, greater Boston area and think of doing history, what we're calling history without borders and um, thinking that of this as a regional um, effort. Uh, we know even within um, Massachusetts, within Eastern Massachusetts, uh, folks who, you know, enslavers who had large tracts of land um, might have a house, say, in um, Cambridge on Brattle Street or in Brookline. Um, and then they had their agricultural um, areas, their, their plantations, um, small, of course, compared to Southern and Caribbean stand standards, but they had their agricultural centers of production um, a little further afield um, in, uh, you know, outside of the city, um, but locally in Massachusetts. So they're, even if they're living and not necessarily enslaving people permanently in our localities, um, they are enslaving people um, to do agricultural labor um, in other parts of Massachusetts. So I'm wondering about this history without borders and what it can teach us and why you think it's important um, to form these coalitions uh, and see this as a, as a larger area rather than as separate um, cities or towns. The more history I learn, the more history I read, and I am indebted to the scholars because without the context, the Brookline facts wouldn't make sense. I mean, wouldn't have a, wouldn't have a, a meaning. Um, so I, what's happened in Brookline, what happened in Cambridge and what happened in Boston, it's pretty much the same thing and Beverly and Hingham um, and um, out on the Cape. And we need more historians working on it. And we need people like us helping them, um, providing some local detail. And what's wonderful is there are some historians who want to help us. Jared Hardesty is one of them. On Monday, he had a meeting with local historians like me, semi-professionals or not professionals. Um, and we met for an hour. And we just asked him questions on finding research sources. And he has three books out. He is probably the best known person to write on, on freedom in the Boston area. And he spent an hour with a bunch of local yokels. Not too many historians will do that. And I salute everyone that does. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, join the Atlantic Black Box. Um, because there is a woman who started Atlantic Black Box to bring all the people in New England who are working on slavery, to bring them together to talk to each other and learn from each other. They have talks, 
they have research questions, um, and, uh, and it's just a great organization and it's friendly. Nobody's supposed to be smarter than anybody else. We're all in this together. We're all finding things out together. So Barbara, I'll ask you, what was the biggest surprise for you in this journey? What was the one thing that really kind of took your, took you by surprise, um, took your breath away maybe? Um, was there a moment or a, a, a source or something that really just kind of transformed your whole worldview, an aha moment for you? It was standing in front of that plaque. He wouldn't tell me what. So first I looked for Jewish names. Then I looked for names like Dukakis. Of course, that was hopeless. And then I looked for other women's names. Oh, sure, it will be women's names. And they weren't there either. And then down at the bottom, damn. And then I went over to the library. And I remember Malcolm Cawthorn, who grew up African-American social studies teacher who grew up in Brookline saying that when we passed a resolution acknowledging the town's role in slaveholding without with specifics he said it was his proudest moment as a Brookline resident that took my breath away and he also said another thing that took my breath away. I always suspected it, but I'd never seen the evidence. And you see, I hadn't always suspected it. If someone had asked me, I would have thought, well, I didn't think slavery was in the North. Hi. So hearing other people say how big it is for them. Um, well, one thing I talk to kids about, and this is back to the white allies questions that Tatiana was asking, is I talk to students about being a stand-upper because I don't like the word white allies because not everybody is either white or black. Um, and I talk about the stand-uppers in Brookline. Uh, including a school principal in 1938 who would not allow four white students to bully a black student when she was at home. The principal called up the mothers of those four white students. 1938, that's a stand upper. And I told these kids, I said, there you are in eighth grade. You're the next generation of stand uppers. You're the ones who can change make a big change. And one of the students wrote to me and said, I didn't know that. And that was a wow moment for me too. But I bet you've had wow moments and Tasiana and all of the other people here who've had wow moments going, damn, I didn't know or damn, now I know. I've got something really important to say. I see that um, Dr. Janie Ward, who's on the call, uh, uh, Dr. Ward, are you? would you like to say something? Did you want to ask a question or make yeah, a comment? Sir, yes. Um, so first, I wanted to thank you, Barbara, for your presentation. This was really, uh, really informative. Thank you. And thank you, Tatiana, uh, for um, moderating the conversation. Um, I wanted to go back for a moment to Tatiana's question about school teachers. And um, both, uh, why is it so difficult to get slavery into the curriculum? And then what do teachers need to know to be able to teach it? Um, and for many years, um, uh, I was at Simmons U University where we were um, training teachers. And one of the things that we immediately discover is that there are some people that when it comes to American slavery know nothing um, and they've gone through, you know, the American public education system um, and college and some of them even graduate schools and they know nothing. But then there are a lot of people who have to 
unlearn what they know because they grew up in communities that either whitewashed it or downplayed it or <sighs> sugarcoated it, you know, whatever the, whatever it is. And, um, and, and so, you know, you present them with alternative information and their minds are blown. And then there's a third problem with American slavery, the study of American slavery, and that is that we are still learning. I mean, it's because of the work that many of you are engaged in right now and certainly talking about that we are adding to, um, you, you know, this reservoir of knowledge. And so it's, it's really hard to teach teachers about a history that is still evolving. So for, you know, first they're dealing with the moral issues, then they're dealing with the affective issues. You know, how does it make me feel? And then there's all this information that's coming out that is like, you know, 1619, which is forcing us to go back and think about what we thought we knew a little bit differently. So I just want to say that it it is um, complex, right? Um, certainly, we need to be thinking about it because these are our children. This is our history. This is a nation that we want to move forward in progressive ways uh, towards social justice. So we have to do this, but we have to recognize just how difficult this work is on multiple levels um, and not beat up the third grade teacher who's, you know, having trouble finding the right words in front of a, a uh, you know, um, a class full of eighth graders. Um, because, yeah, because it's hard. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. You good. said it. Uh, thank you. Byron Rushing gave a talk at the unveiling of the stone in, outside of the cemetery called The Danger of Historical Amnesia. Mm. Right. And that's on our website. Yeah. Great, great. I, I would think, too, that you would have to contend with the very different levels of um, family engagement, parental um, background, right? So these kids are not coming um, to the classroom in a vacuum. They're coming with their uh, knowledge or lack thereof. Uh, the, the same three things that, that Dr. Ward mentioned, right? They're either their complete lack of background on um, the history of slavery or um, their, you know, somewhat knowledge um, or their knowledge uh, that's completely wrong and has to be sort of um, stripped away before they can um, enter into that conversation. So the teachers are not only dealing with their own um, multiple levels of, of comfort and, and knowledge, but um, having kids being coming into the classroom at very different um, places as well. I agree. I also just want to say, like, shout out, there are teachers doing this work, right? Yeah, like, can we just say the teachers that are doing this work <laughs> are incredible, and those voices are lost. Um, my children attended the Fletcher Maynard School in the Port in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> I see folks shouting out, and uh, their teachers did the work, right? Yeah. Um, I, it may not have been in any official curriculum. I'm sure it wasn't, but aren't the best teachers going off script anyways, right? Uh, <laughs> at least mine were, and mine were in Brookline, right? My, mine didn't believe in a script, um, and that's, you know, why I became the kind of radical educator I am, but I, I think there are certainly um, teachers doing the work. I think my question when I was asking was more about, like, how do we support teachers in a, in a structural way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what can we do to give... Um, you know, principals and, and, you know, whoever's training teachers, you know, to make them equipped. So for me, it was shocking to see the standards that you have to do to get certified to teach. Mm -hmm. um, very little social studies, right. virtually nothing social studies in history. So my students at Leslie could, you know, take a thousand math and ELA classes um, on how to teach ELA and how to teach math mm -hmm. and virtually nothing on social studies and how to teach history. Um, and then, you know, I think- and Brookline's cut back at social studies in yeah. K, to, K to four. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, also, hours. I think the, um, 
the awful ways people have taught slavery has made people really scared of teaching it, right? I mean, so, we've seen all of these horrible examples of, um, and this isn't to shout out individual teachers, I think systemically, you know, um, these you know, very interactive ways of teaching slavery, um, where teachers stand on children's backs and horrific things that happen. We see that in a new, every year, there's a new example of someone who taught slavery the worst way you should ever teach slavery, right? Um, yeah. And my yeah. students say that they experience that too. You know, I had one student who said, who's from Massachusetts, who said they went on a trip um, in the woods and the teachers woke them up abruptly in the middle of the night and had them run in the woods in the middle of the night to simulate being on the Underground Railroad and escaping to freedom, right? Um, this student is like 21. So when did they go to school? Like yesterday, right? Like not that long ago, they were in school. Um, and so for me, you know, there's, I think that that's also it. It's like, if you don't have the tools and there's no structural support, right. then you make stuff up and you may not do it well because you know, no one's told you, you know, that's probably not appropriate to simulate a slave auction, right? That's probably not the best way to learn it, right? But um, shout out to all the teachers who are definitely doing it, um, especially in the Cambridge and, and Brookline schools. There's a Brookline teacher who always starts her third grade unit on slavery and freedom with reading um, the picture book about Harriet Tubman's childhood. And the students are shocked because these third graders, at least in her class, and they were black and, and white and Asian, didn't know the children were enslaved. So their question was, how could this be? How could this be? And so they had question after question, which just opened up the discussion. And because they were in third grade, she said, at least, that there wasn't this, the black students feeling everybody was staring at them. They were all facing this problem together. Um, and that's one of the reasons why to do it early. Um, and that's a shout out to Beth. I forget Beth's last name. Um, so, oh, yeah. yeah, this is... This is wonderful. We have so many um, amazing, oh uh, yes, Erica Armstrong Dunbar, um, amazing. We have so many great resources in the chat. I am um, saving our chat and when I send out the um, survey link, which will be tomorrow morning, look for it in your inbox. And I'm going to also send out um, a link to all of these great resources. I'll have a list of them, um, including videos, YouTube recordings, uh, books, articles, everything that's been um, put in here. So um, I just want to take a, another uh, opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Cruz. This was a wonderful program, so much to delve into and so much work um, left to do. But thank you so much for um, helping us on this journey. Um, and I want to thank everybody for coming um, and for folks who uh, enjoyed being with us maybe for the first or second time and you want to get on our list and make sure that uh, you're included in our future programs, go over to historycambridge.org, um, sign up for our e-news. Um, and this was a, a reminder that this event was free. Um, and if you enjoyed our time together here, please consider making a donation to help us um, continue to do this important work. And we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Thank you all so much and have a good, safe and warm evening. Bye. Take care.